Hello, everyone, and welcome to another live presentation of Making Things with Milo. I'm your host, and welcome to our presentation. If you're not familiar with who I am and what we do here, uh, I'm the mold maker and part of the sales department as well as video department crew, and SmoothOn is the manufacturer of silicones, urethane plastics, epoxies, expanding foam, as well as other materials related to the mold making casting, building, medical, and other industries. Now today we're going to be talking about multi-part molds and what it takes to create a multi-part mold and how to make a better multi-part mold. Now what will actually determine how many parts your mold is going to have? Most likely it's going to be the actual model that you're working with. It's the model itself that basically will determine uh, what type of mold you're making, how many parts it's going to have, and are you going to be doing a brush-on mold or a block mold? Now, I prepared a very simple graphic for you guys to see to kind of get the point across of what we're trying to achieve here. So if we made a two-part mold of an object that's very intricate and difficult, you're not going to be able to demold it. There's going to be sections that are going to be uh, stuck in the mold, and you can see them in the red area. Those are going to be embedded in the mold, and you're not going to be able to retrieve your casting or your model. Now, if we try to make the same mold the other way, vertically, and we split it in uh, two, we're encountering the same issue. If we're trying to pull that mold apart, you can see where the uh, model or the casting will get stuck inside that mold. Now, you may think that's not a big deal if you're dealing with a silicone mold that's flexible and you can retrieve your object out of it. But if you're actually working with a, a rigid mold or a support shell on that uh, mold, you're not going to be able to retrieve that and going to have to actually break something, either the model or the uh, casting or the... the support shell itself. Now to, uh, to work with a difficult object uh, like what we have, you might consider going uh, alternative route and creating a three-part or multi-part mold where the parts off the mold will come off the model and make it much easier to retrieve it. So as you can see in our graphic here, this is a multi-part mold on the same object and it's much easier to get that object out of that mold by being able to remove it away from the model. So that kind of puts it in uh, at a very simple terms of what we're trying to achieve with our uh, presentation here today. Now, I did prepare a couple of models for you guys here that uh, we're going to examine quickly. And uh, one thing that they all have in common is that they're not uh, easy to reproduce in a very regular mold. So they're going to need uh, multi-part molds. Now let's just take a look at what we have here. We have everything from a lens cover for a signal light, a motorcycle handle, a model of a camera, some ceramic wear, with very interesting setup for the legs here, very decorative uh, glass for wine, and coffee mug, some RC tires, modeling tires for, for my models, a model of a skeleton that I found in my closet, and again, very intricate and requires multi-part molds. And today we're going to be actually focusing on this model right here. These are the candlesticks that you guys might have seen in the last presentation that we had. And speaking of live uh, presentation, the last presentation we did have was with my coworker Janessa. She did a presentation on epoxy putties. So if you guys want to check those out, very useful information in those. Uh, you can always go back to our video channel and check those out. So, but going back to our models here, we're going to be focusing our presentation on this candlestick today and show you how I went about making the mold for this piece right here. Now, before you actually go ahead and start any kind of mold making uh, for your molds, you want to think about the process itself. You want to think about the approach you're going to take 
to the models that you're handling. What's the best approach? What kind of materials will you be using? <clears throat> and what kind of mold you're going to be designing? What kind of finish do you want from the castings coming out of those molds? All has to be thought well in advance before you start the mold making process because you don't want to discover halfway down the process that the mold that you're attempting to make is just going to, not going to work and you have to start over again. So make sure that you plan well in advance when, uh, when preparing for a mold like this. Always, always keep the end result in mind. What are you trying to achieve? And uh, that can be also part of process uh, what is it going to take to process your castings, demold them, and finish them? Has to be all thought of advanced, uh, well in advanced. So keep the end result in mind. Now, when you do decide uh, how you're going to go about your project, it's always recommended to get a second opinion. Get somebody who knows and understands the subject that you're working with, mold making. Uh, but if you can't get a hold of somebody, there's always um, helpful uh, information available to you. More specifically, you can go to our website where you're going to find the FAQ, the video section. Uh, and that information, of course, is going to be uh, in the description below. But you have a lot of resources that you can use for that. You have videos, you have FAQs, technical support is something uh, that we really like here and pride ourselves in. You can give us a call ask questions if they're really quick and short, or you can always uh, send us a tech ticket, uh, which we will then respond to. If you do send a ticket, uh, you can always uh, uh, add a picture of your project so that we can get a better idea of what you're working with. Now, beyond our own uh, videos and FAQs, you can always uh, check into some social media groups and ask for help there as well. There's a lot of social media groups that deal with mold making, casting, and make sure you join them so that when you have these questions, you can reach out to a wide variety of mold makers and casters that have experience in these things. Now, when you, uh, when you do decide which way you're gonna go forward with your model and you decided uh, to start making the mold, we're actually going to take a quicker uh, look at that before actually start making any of the mold boxes. I'm just going to move these models aside, make some room for our presentation. And I will keep these candlesticks in the background here because that's going to be our main model they're going to be working with. Now, if you do have questions about what's going on, what I'm presenting here, uh, in case you're not understanding something, make sure you voice them out. Let us know you have questions. There is a live feed where you can ask the questions. And then one of my coworkers is going to actually answer them. And I do have a coworker sitting here near me. His name is Jason. You're gonna hear him uh, ask me questions live on camera. I'm going to then repeat those questions so you guys can hear them. And then we're gonna attempt to answer the question. Now, keep in mind that I don't know all the answers to mold making questions either. Uh, if I don't know something, I'm going to attempt to answer uh, the best I can, or if I can't, I'm just gonna get that information for you guys later and let you know down in the descriptions below. So let's just start with our first model here, our first setup. So here you guys can see I've already decided how I'm going to lay my model out. Uh, this is our candlestick, and if you can uh, just take a quick look here, I set it up on some first uh, foam pieces to build up uh, the height that I needed for my model, and then I added a, a, about an inch of clay on top of those until I was able to embed my model completely, uh, or halfway in this case actually, into the clay. Now, I already made certain decisions about this model, and these two uh, placeholders are basically going to become their own parts. They're going to come apart that way. And we're going to be uh, starting with making a, a piece for the top of this mold first. So your setup is going to look something like this. It's not always going to be look, looking exactly like it, because every mold maker does things a little different. 
but uh, when you do make these decisions, keep in mind that you could be uh, changing things down the line, adjusting the mold uh, or remaking the mold in case something did not work well with that setup. And I actually uh, want to show you guys what I mean by that. So here is the original mold that I made uh, for this candlestick project. And I'm going to open this mold to show you guys what's going inside. So we have our two parts of our mold with the plug on top. And the area that I was having troubles with and the reason why I decided to revisit this project is this area down here. This is all one part of the mold. So what happens when I try to demold this piece is I put a lot of stress on this area. If the resin is not fully cured, it can deform the casting and also creates a really difficult area for me to demold with this nubbit here. Now, furthermore, after I uh, started casting these into this mold, I discovered there's an air bubble behind here, which there's no way you guys are going to be able to see, but I'll show you what you can see. So you can see, I'm going to turn this, there's a little booger in there. You see that little booger? So that is filling into the air bubble when I cast into that mold. Now I have this piece to remove every time I cast into the mold. So I have to now accommodate for that removal in the process of casting this, which it doesn't render the most, uh, mold useless, but it definitely adds an additional step to my uh, process, which I wanted to avoid. So I wanted to then go ahead and make this a four-part mold instead of a three-part mold to ease with that issue that I was having with the mold. So you can see that even though the mold was successful in my next setup, I definitely decided to change things up a little bit. So once you achieve this step right here and you prepare your model for the actual pour, Milo, before you go any further, a quick question about when you uh, clay up that model the first time. Yes. You don't put any release on it yet. Okay. Right? So we have a question about mold release on your uh, clay. Uh, and I was going to get to that in this uh, next uh, uh, setup here, but let's just talk about it a little bit here. Um, do you need a release agent on the clay itself? You have to first understand the materials that you're working with. So the clay that we're working with is a uh, oil-based clay. This is Sculptix Soft. And because it's an oil-based clay, I know that it will not inhibit the silicone. I know that it will not stick to silicone. Um, but uh, a lot of mold makers will still go the extra step and put release agent on the uh, clay itself. Uh, is it necessary? Not really. Uh, is it a cheap uh, insurance that you will easily remove that from your clay? Yes, it is. So uh, it's neither wrong or right. It really comes down to you as the mold maker, as the user of which, which way to go. So I hope that helps with the answer. Uh, moving on to, and keep the questions coming, by the way. Uh, we're we're going to take every attempt to answer them. So uh, moving on to the next step here, we have now made a mold box around our model, around our setup. And uh, you can see, I'm going to make sure right there, you can see I put this piece in here that's going to basically follow the contour of the model. So you can see that our setup is not flat, it has a pyramid type of structure set up. And I put this block in here in order to block out all this extra material that's going to get poured into that corner. So basically what this is, it's a setup to block out an empty space out of our mold in order to conserve material. At the end of the day, if you have to handle these molds by hand and they're very heavy, that's a negative thing for your mold making experience. And um, it's also going to save you a lot of material, which uh, results in saving money. 
Now, let's take a look one more time into this box here. So from this step, from our original clay up to this step here, we have completely cleaned up our lines. We added keys into the clay and we constructed a mold box around the model. We also put a space blocker to shape our mold so it mimics the contours of the model. Keep in mind that your mold walls uh, don't need to be uh, in an excess thickness. You can keep it between 3 8 to an inch thick uh, so that you don't waste a lot of material. Now, once you're uh, at this step right here, you're ready to pour your material inside the first cavity that you created for your mold. Now, I'm just going to move this along. And once you pour the material into the mold box and you demold it, you should have something like this. This is our first half or our first quarter, as right, I said, off the mold. And you can see that shape that we're mimicking our model and resulting in a lot of material savings by not having these corners here. Also on the other side. Now, you should have a model now that looks something like this. You start removing your clay and you're basically going to remove all the clay that you have to except you don't want to remove the clay where you want to keep the spacers for the next parts so and you can see here i did not put any release on this clay and it comes off quite easily and quite clean actually now these are the two parts that we're still planning to make uh, uh, um, basically parts off the mold. Uh, this is our next step here is going to be the other half of the mold. And the, these are the additional parts. Now, one thing uh, that can happen at this point, and I want to give you guys a, a heads up, is something called seeping under the model. Or uh, in other words, it's when material seeps underneath uh, the first half of your mold. Now, what that is going to look like in your mold is something like this. And you can see the color difference. We have the lighter uh, main material of our first uh, quarter. And then inside, there's a feathering of darker rubber. This, this is where the material seeped underneath the model and then adhere to the first part of the mold. Now, if you're lucky, you're going to be able to remove this by peeling it out but most of the time you're actually not going to be able because that actually bonded to the previous layer of silicone. Now, what can you do to remedy this? Uh, really what you can do is think ahead again. You wanna keep in mind these things that can, could go wrong before they happen. Now, this is a little bit controversial. Some old makers say, I would never do that. Some people do it constantly. Um, I found it to be very useful uh, in certain mold making aspects. So before putting everything together and getting ready to mold the other side, what I attempt to do sometimes is remove the model, put some release agent. This is East Release 205, is a liquid release for silicone to silicone. I will put the release agent uh, on the interior underneath the model. And this is going to reassure me that if anything seeps underneath there, I'll be able to just peel off and not have to remake this part of the mold. So it's, it's a technique that some people use. Some people say, don't use it because you're disturbing the model. Uh, I attempt to use it when I need to. Uh, the trick is here to reposition your model nicely and tightly back into the mold and then build up the clay parts that you need to for the next part. So, and let's uh, just take a look at what the next part should look like. Move some of my models out of the way for you. Remember, keeping a clean work surface is going to produce better, cleaner work. So, here's our set up. Now, I've already went ahead, uh, put release agent 
onto, uh, onto the silicone. I put back my clay pieces. You can see this. There's my uh, space holder for the third and then fourth part. So those are just keeping the place uh, occupied until I'm ready to pour silicone in there. Um, but you can see again that I set up my mold box with the spacer here to keep that shape off the mold, mimicking the original model. Again, this is a material saver uh, aspect of mold making. Now I'm just going to hot melt this other piece in place, and then we're actually going to pour the material into the mold. So Mila, that piece that you're adhering there, that's like foam core board. Someone was asking about mold box materials. We're just using the acrylic for visibility. Right. But for what you're doing there, because it's lightweight and easy to adhere, you're using foam core. Right. So we have a question about what's the material that I'm using for these spacers here. This is foam core or gator board. It's for posters. Um, it's uh, something that we use readily here in the, uh, in the mold room and it lends itself really good for mold boxes. Uh, silicone will not stick to it. Uh, it will not penetrate into the cardboard coating. And the reason why I'm using the plexiglass here is so you guys can actually see inside the mold. That's the only reason. Otherwise, there is a wide variety of mold box materials that you can use. You just want to keep in mind what's appropriate. Um, something that is sealed. So uh, plax plastic is not penetrable. It's not porous. Nothing will adhere to it very easily. Uh, melamine board is very good because it's not porous. But if you take raw wood, that's a very porous material and stuff will stick to it. So keep that in mind as you set up your mold boxes. So a very good question there. Uh, I find the I find the gator board or foam core board uh, very easy to use. It's easy to uh, manipulate, cut, and uh, it's readily available. Uh, so it's a product that I go to for my mold making uh, needs quite often. So keep that in mind as you uh, work with these materials. Now we will mix up uh, a batch of silicone and pour it into the other half of our mold here. And uh, there is something that I did want to address that I get asked quite a bit when, uh, when dealing with these types of molds. How do you figure out how much material do you need for this mold box right now? And there is two ways to go about it. You can go to our website. There is a link on the main page for a materials calculator. And again, you're gonna find that in the description below, but it's really good to use it because you can actually take measurements of your mold box, use the uh, pour on mold estimator, pick the material that you're working with, and then figure out what your mold box is, your model is, and kind of get a better idea of how much material you're gonna need for that project. Now there is a, uh, there's one thing about that part that I'm not really fond of is it gives you the answer in, uh, in, in, in weight basically and you have to use a gram scale. So what I attempt to do instead is I guesstimate. I make a, a, a guess estimate of how much, how much material is going to be uh, required for this container for this box. So since I'm dispensing the material into these deli cups, I take one of these deli cups and literally go over to my model and I literally lay it out. Okay, this thing takes about three of these cups of material. So when I'm dispensing the material itself, I'm going to base my estimate on that. Now, that's, again, just going to give you estimate as far as how much material you're going to need. It's not 100% uh, proof that that's exactly how much product you need. Now, I'm going to go ahead and dispense my material into a clean mixing container. 
and pour that really quick so you guys can see what it looks like when that comes together. Now, this is the same material. It's Mold Star 16 Fast that I used for the first part of the mold. The reason why it's colored darker is because I added some Silk Pig Blue in order to be able to easily differentiate the different parts of the mold that we're building. Sometimes the color code can help out the person that's putting the mold together to work uh, uh, the, the process much faster. A couple other questions that I get asked often is, I didn't have enough material to pour into the mold uh, and now I have to wait for product till it gets back to me in order to pour more, or I mix too much, uh, what do I do with the extra material? Uh, if you don't have enough material, uh, don't worry, get some more product, make sure it's the same material, and then you can clean the surface of your prior mold, isopropyl alcohol, let that dry and then top it off. But the more uh, interesting question that I get is, what do I do with the extra material that I have? So I always like to mix a little bit extra so that I'm not left shorthanded when I actually go to pour the mold. Now, as always, when you're working with these materials, first off, keep in mind the working time of the material. So how much time do you have from combining the A and B together? and the cure time, and make sure that you get it poured in time. The other thing is you always wanna scrape the sides, scrape the bottom of your mixing container to make sure that you incorporate those two parts very well together. And since this part is really important to me, this mold, I'm going to double mix the material where you transfer the mixed product into a mold, uh, a clean mixing container and you basically give it one more good mix before pouring it into the mold box itself. Now this is a really cheap insurance to make sure that you combine the two components well together and that you won't have any kind of uh, soft spots or inhibition in your mold. All right, we're ready to pour. As always, when you set up your mold boxes, I'm gonna make sure you guys can see in there. Very good. And you can see here, this is my pour spout, so to say. This is my opening for the pour. Now, when you're pouring a material like this, you always wanna pour from up high in a thin stream. Let the material seek its own level in the mold and that is going to push away any air bubbles from the model. And there you have it. A simple, easy mix and pour for our second part of the mold. Now, again, going back to that question, what do I do with this extra material that I have left over? A lot of times, I make these silicone pillows that I use for my tools, for my razor blades, for my sculpting tools. And then once they spent, I just toss them out. But what I really like to do is prep more molds. So I already prepped this mold a while ago. It was a project that it wasn't important to me. I just put it on the back burner. It's ready to go though. I, I'm, put a mold box around it already. And now I have that material left over and this is what I'm gonna use it for. I'm preparing and making the next mold that otherwise would have just sat around and waited for me to, to work on it. So it's really good habit to prep these mold boxes and have them ready to go. So when you do have leftover extra material, you can easily get your next project off the ground. So we're just going to move this aside and let that cure up. Move 
side of the way for you. This is a really good question. Um, somebody actually is asking whether you could have done just a brush-on mold huh. of this piece. Why would you do the, I, I know we're kind of going down a different road, but. Right, yeah. uh, so uh, Jason just uh, shared a question with us. Um, did I have to make a block mold of that piece? Uh, let's just pull this out here uh, so you guys can actually see it. It's a huge block of rubber here. Um, did I have to make this uh, block mold? Mm, yes and no. It really came down to a few factors and it always will come down to what are you trying to achieve with this? Um, do you have time to make a, a brush on mold? Do you have material? Do you have resources? Uh, who's going to be handling the mold? How fast do you need to get it out of the casting? All those questions go into answering that question. Um, can I make a brush on mold? Yeah, I could. Uh, and just to show you guys an example, what a brush on mold would look like off of that. So here you have a brush on mold of, here's our model. So here's our model glass. And instead of making a block mold of that, so you guys can see it, instead of making a block mold of this, which would have eaten up easily, it would have eaten up easily that much rubber, I decided to save material by doing a brush on mold. So here you have the brush on, you see how thin that is, it's only about a quarter inch thickness. I still have the same thing. I have keys built into it along the side. It's a multi-part mold. So we have one, two, and three parts. So why did I choose to go this route and not make it a block mold? Well, there's two things. Uh, this object is very uh, thin and detailed. Uh, so I planned on casting actually uh, smash plastic into this mold to make uh, breakable props of this glass. Now imagine if I tried to demold this out of a solid block of rubber, you might end up just breaking the piece. So I ended up making a brush on mold so that I can easily ply away a flexible thin rubber from my model. The downturn uh, to this making a brush on mold, I needed a support shell. This is a uh, Plasti Paste 2 support shell. Nice and strong, thin, great for uh, support shells. But now instead of having a three or four part mold, I have a six part mold. I have every part gets two parts. Let's get this out as well. So we have a plug here. Now to assemble this mold takes a lot longer than uh, to assemble a block mold, but I took that in consideration knowing that I only needed to make one of two of these castings per day. So that's where you're, you as the mold maker are going to make that distinguishment. Do I make a brush on mold or do I make a block mold? Does that make sense guys? I hope it does. All right, so after we poured our second half, Get some of these models out of the way. Oh, by the way, this is the, this is the castings that came out of that mold. So I just wanted to guy, show you guys. Because we made a very detailed, clean mold, the castings coming out of that mold were great. And this is Smoothcast 325 that I casted this in. So moving on. This is what your mold should uh, will look like when you demold uh, from the second half, uh, the second part. You're going to have your part, uh, first part, your second part, your color difference here is great, and then you're going to have your space holder still. So this is my third part, and then here on the other side, this is my fourth part of the, uh, or space holder. So for the next part, what you want to do is you want to remove this next uh, piece. And we're going to do that, just so you understand what's happening here. We're going to go slowly and remove some of that oil-based clay. 
Now, at this point, you don't want to disturb the model as much because you, it, it becomes more difficult to actually uh, close the mold, get the uh, release agent in there. But you want to go around and remove that clay. Here we go. Now, you want to make sure to put release agent on the inside of this. You can see there's keys pointing different directions. Let me see. There we go. There's keys pointing different directions, and because they're pointing different directions, they're actually going to hold that part in place quite nicely. But before we go and pour material in here, make sure you put release agent inside and also on the top here as well. Keep in mind, we're doing this one piece at a time, so the other side is still going to have the clay embedded in it. So our next step, again, you're pouring more material. And this is what it should look like once you pour the third part. So we have our uh, light blue, dark blue, and our green. I constantly keep adding silk pig uh, uh, pigment into the silicone, again, because the color uh, coating makes it easier for the person that has to assemble the mold back together. So again, this is our last part now that we have. The, there's still clay inside. A third part was poured. And we can now go ahead and remove this as well. We're going to just go ahead and start picking it out with the tool until all the clay is removed. And that's when you're going to put some release agent and then pour the fourth part of the mold. And once you have that poured, your mold should look something like this. Well, we have our <clears throat> one, two, third part, and now the fourth part was poured in as well, and we're ready for the demold. So I'm going to simply open this up and show you guys what's going on inside the mold. We have our second part as our first part. I'm going to remove the model, and you can see where those uh, space holders now are part of the mold. So here's one, and then here's the other. Now note something here is that these keys have different numbers embedded in them to correspond to the ones on here in the part of the mold. So you always know, okay, there is six, seven, eight on this side. So this is the side that's always going to go towards that. So it makes it easier to put these molds back together by alternating and changing the number of keys that you put in there. So I'm going to put that back in. All right. Now, we already planned for this mold uh, to be cut into. So here I already started. I'm going to continue with this. This is going to be the top of the mold, and these are going to become our pour spouts and air vents. Um, let's see the old mold where we put that. All right. Just so you guys understand what's going on here. So here you can see the air vent or pour spouts that were cut into the rubber after the mold was made. So these decisions, again, are made well in advance so that when you get to your project, to your part that, that now needs cutting, you already accommodate it for that. I'm going to use one of my curved knives here. And I'm simply now going to cut into the mold or into that block. Let's see if you guys see that. Voila, there it is. So just a little profile shot there. All right. This is where I cut that key in, or, or pour spout. And I'm going to repeat that on all four corners. That's where it's going to be, uh, that's what's going to be used to pour material in the mold. So could I have, I, could, uh, could I have set these up into the clay? and made these parts with the uh, pour spouts in place? Yes, I could have. Uh, it would have uh, taken a lot more time to set 
that up and I was not willing to commit to that extra time. So I planned ahead in creating these pour spouts and now also adding some air vents in between as well. So again, it goes well into the beginning and planning these things out before you start the mold making process. So as you can see, it's really not that complicated from making a two-part mold. It's just that you keep blocking out parts and filling them with material as you go along. It's not really anything special. It's just extra steps that you would have uh, in case you're making a multi-part versus a two-part mold. Uh, this is a little bit too small, so we're going to go with the bigger knife. Um, in case you're wondering, uh, these knives I make myself. I simply heat up uh, the blades and I melt, uh, 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 bend them. Let's see here, you can see that. See that hook? That becomes a nice carving tool for channels on your mold. Let's see, a couple more here. And then we're going to actually assemble the mold and cast into it just to see the first casting that, it com that comes out of there and if we need to do any kind of further adjustments on the mold itself. Now, you might have heard me say this before, but just because a mold looks good doesn't mean it works well and vice versa. So we're going to test how this mold works in order to know what the results are going to be, uh, how much casting material we're going to need to use in these molds going forward. So it's always, it's a part of the mold making process to once you make the mold, to actually do a test casting or a cleaning the mold process, some people say. I'm simply going to strap these with a couple of Again, it's gator board, easy to use. And this is what I love about it. You score it, and then you just break away what you don't need. And keep in mind that this is just one way that uh, mold makers and casters will set up their molds. Um, every mold maker is going to do these things a little differently. And there is not really a wrong or right way unless your mold or your casting uh, coming out of that mold is not satisfactory, not what you wanted it to be. <clears throat> so here's our mold. And to tell you the truth, these, uh, these pour spouts are a little small. You can make that a little bigger, but I'm just going to go ahead and mix some material and pour it in there. So, got our gloves. Make sure you always protect yourself. And for the casting of this, because we're just looking for a quick turnaround casting, I'm going to be using uh, Smoothcast 300Q. Uh, 300Q is a bright white casting resin. The Q stands for quick. So now in this case, because it's a silicone mold, it's a urethane resin, you don't need to put a release in there. Right, so another question here coming in. Um, because this is a silicone mold, we don't need to use a release agent. That is correct. The, the, the re, uh, casting resin will release from the silicone just fine. Um, keep in mind that the silicone molds eventually do get spent. They get used and uh, they deteriorate. So by using a, a release agent, you're going to prolong the life the, of that mold. The, uh, the, the mold itself is going to be useful to you for much longer that way. Um, so can you use release agent? Yes. Do you have to? No, not necessarily. But keep that in mind because it does 
deteriorate the molds. So it's all about expectations and understanding what you're getting out. Now, if you do use a release agent, keep in mind that that release agent needs to be washed and removed before you can paint the casting. Otherwise, the paint just won't stick. So again, smooth cast 300Q, fast setting resin. Keep in mind the working time of these materials. This is 30 second working time. I'm gonna add a drop of so strong black. That's one drop here is gonna be sufficient. And that's to change the color from a bright white to a warm gray or gray color because this is a test casting. Mix the pigment in. I'm going to mix it much better in a larger container. Scrape the sides, scrape the bottom. Even when you're mixing your pigments in, uh, you might think that the pigment is mixed in thoroughly, but it may not be. So follow this simple procedure by scraping the sides, scraping the bottom of your mixing container. And once my pigment is worked in, we can add our part A. Again, scraping the sides, scraping the bottom off the mixing container. Now, because this is a really fast setting material, I don't have much time to double mix. So it's even more important to be very thorough when mixing the two components. I have a feeling that these pore spouts are way too small. I'm going to attempt it anyways. Now keep the questions coming if you have them. I'm going to try to answer them as best as I can. And I'm just taking a second here to focus on this pour because the mold maker didn't make the pour spouts large enough. So I'm going to have to talk to him about that. And this is why we call it Q. It sets up really fast. So this pour might be a waste uh, because the pour spouts were not large enough on the uh, opening of our mold. But uh, this is very much the uh, process that you want to do. Get a casting in there and get it tested to see if that mold is going to work. Now I'm going to put this aside and let's just kind of examine a couple of other models that I prepped for you guys. I dug in the, uh, uh, the dungeon and dug up a couple of molds and models that we made prior to this for other projects. And here you have a, that same camera that we showed you earlier. Here's our model. So this is my first casting that came out of the mold where I tested the mold to see how it's going to work. This is my next casting that came out the way I wanted it to is clear with a slight tint, water tint. So it came out quite nice. So the mold worked just the way I wanted it to. But let's just take a look quickly at the mold itself. So this is a three-part mold. It's not a four-part mold. But it was executed uh, the same way. We done first one half of the part. So everything that you see here was at some point uh, clay. So these parts were all clay until we removed them and poured silicone in the place. And you can see here that it comes nicely together with all these keys around the perimeter. That mold fits nicely together. And this is my pore spout here. So at the end of the day, I, w I had to uh, grind this away. Now let's see a profile here. So this was the pore spout here, this area. And you can see how much material then had to be grinded away and polished in order to get this piece finished. But 
an object that you could not mold it in a two-part block mold or two-part mold. Now, could you have done a brush-on mold of this? Yes, but it would have eaten up a lot more of your time trying to get that mold made. A couple of other uh, pieces that we have here lined up um, that I really enjoy. So here we have a mold for a skeleton for uh, a cat rib cage and uh, the uh, back as well. And this mold here, uh, what was a little bit different on it, there was not really uh, three parts to it unless you made the third part, which was the core here. So you can see that I had to make the core uh, opening in the back here <coughs> in the bottom in order to actually get the core made. And uh, I'm just going to open this up so you guys can see what it looks like. So our plug comes out. There it is. Kind of weird shaped plug, but you know, it's really what it takes. You got to understand how to get that material in there. You can see that I keyed and shape this quite a bit so that the fitment of this piece into the mold itself is very tight and minimizes any kind of cleanup effort and the post uh, work that has to be done on the casting themselves. And then to retrieve my casting, simply gonna pry this back a little bit and then peel it out. Uh, speaking of that, Milo, um, cleanup of castings, when you choose a parting line, I know we discussed this in the venting molds mm -hmm. uh, a little bit, but when you choose a parting line, you're, are you choosing it for ease of cleanup? Are you choosing it for ease of getting the mold apart? Uh, it, it depends project to project. Right. But. So the question here is how to choose uh, the separation lines of your mold. Um, a project like this, the, the skeleton here, becomes a lot more difficult and involved in choosing that. You have to really think about these things. Now, I do have some flashing here that I have to remove, but this piece is quite a bit difficult to make that call. Um, the camera here, see if you guys can zoom in on that. I'll move some of these things out of the way. The camera here, uh, became very, very easy because I was able to trace the uh, lines off the actual camera where they come together. And that way I was able to hide them so they follow the contours that are already in the object. Another one where it becomes really easy and obvious is the candlestick here. The candlestick has a parting line from the original that's on the side here as well as on the side here. So I knew already when I looked at the model that this is how I was going to mold it with, with the sides coming together like this. So you always want to put the separation lines where they're hidden or where they're easy to clean up and you're not going to have a rigid line that's really visible. Um, the motorcycle handle that, uh, that I have is a really good example of that. So we can see the separation lines here on the casting. We can see them all along here. And that's because the, the part itself, the finished part, it was expected to have that. It was okay for it to have that separation line and to be visible. Um, some models, you don't want to have that visible. You don't want it to show. Others, it's not that important and you're okay with showing them off. So it's a good idea to try to hide them uh, as much as you can. Sometimes you're gonna have to come back and clean them up afterwards to make the casting presentable. So where do you put those separation lines? Uh, where, you can see, uh, where you can't see them or where they're really visible and you can easily clean them up. But more importantly, it always comes down to that graphic in the beginning of the video. 
Um, if you remember, the model has to be able to come out of the mold. You, you have to be able to get it out. So if you put those separation lines um, on the model where it's locking it back in place, locking it in the mold, then you're failed more or less. So you, you have to think about those things well in advance before you start making or designing the mold. A uh, couple other pieces uh, that I wanted to show you guys. Here is a uh, mold for, the, for this, um, uh, what would you call this? this it's, is, a, it's a light cover from... Yeah, uh, a light cover yeah. for a signal light? Yeah, it was from uh, like a uh, forklift. Yeah, so yeah. Um, seems very simple. Yet, when you look at it, the, the cover itself, the, the light itself has ribs all over it, inside, outside. So all that has to be captured in the mold. And when I was designing this mold and thinking about this, I made sure that the, the piece that goes deeply into the model, that that is hollow. So this part now becomes collapsible and much easier to maneuver in and out of that casting. Now, this itself uh, ended up being a three-part mold. Get this out. This ended up being a three-part mold. And I designed it so that when you put it together, It actually fits in a common popcorn container that we use here in the uh, shop. So this became the mold's support shell. So again, something that I thought about before I went to make the mold, as far as how big the mold is going to be, the spacing that I need on the sides, and what's gonna hold everything together. So a lot of thought went into that before designing it um, and, and uh, deciding which, which way I'm going to go about making the mold. All right. And a couple other models. Uh, this you might be familiar with. Uh, this is a mold for RC car tires. Now, the reason why I needed this to be a three-part mold is because the thickness of the tire here itself has to be same on every casting. So I had to control that thickness on the inside. And for that, this mold receives a plug that keeps the contour of the tire uh, consistent and same on the inside. And you can see how that mold looks. Because all this is keyed, Let's see, uh, make sure you guys can see that. There we go. You see how this is not flat, uh, round, it's flattened here? That makes sure to fit perfectly into the mold that's also keyed. See that? The mold gets put together. Materials are injected into the pore spout until they come out of the air holes. And once the casting is done, it will look something like this. And you can see here, this is the uh, pore spout and the vents that are still attached to the casting. And I was very, uh, very strategic with the vents here. I'll just rip this off. I was very strategic with the vents to place them on the inside lip of this tire so when I clean up the castings, there's no visible uh, pore spout or air vents on the castings themselves. So this still has a lot of flashing on it that needs to be cleaned up, but uh, keep those things in mind as you're designing these molds. Now, sometimes the mold itself does not need to be a three-part mold. Uh, when you're working with some flat stuff, uh, and in this case, very specific, I made molds for these little tires. 
Now, I could easily made these in a two-part mold. Sorry, these are really tiny, but um, that's what they are. I could have made a two-part mold, but because, again, I hid the delivery system of them on the inside of the uh, tire, I decided to go ahead and make a three-part mold for the delivery system. And this is what I mean. The lower two halves of this mold, the bottom plate and the mid plate, is actually what holds the model in place. It's where the cavity is. While the top half and the second part of the mold is where the delivery system is hidden. So here's the opposite side. This is where I inject the material through with a syringe. There's my air holes. The material gets injected here. It splits into four and feeds down below into the uh, uh, channels until it comes out in an air vent. So you can see that the model itself was OK to be molded in two halves, but because of the delivery system and where I placed those air vents and pour spout made it more difficult. And I had to uh, figure out a way to uh, make the material deliver in the mold itself. So that's why three-part mold design here. So with that said, you have to understand that a lot of these uh, mold designs are going to be different from mold maker to mold maker based on uh, uh, his or her abilities, knowledge, material knowledge, and so on. One of the things that uh, actually came up, if we can go back to that light, um, you know, the yellow light that you had cast? Yep. Um, the void inside of that, the pink part, right. was that made with a mixing cup? Right. So a question here that we got, Jason uh, told me, how do you keep this void inside, uh, inside our third part? And uh, if you could see in there, you will discover that that was actually a mixing cup. And uh, just so you guys see, I'm going to take a mixing cup and actually put it in there. So it was a mixing cup, and there was a material built up onto it. So the mixing cup itself was not tall enough. So I filled it with material and then built it up a little bit higher to fill the void that I needed. Um, I really like to use these types of uh, containers that you can find in the studio for containers for the molds as well as the plugs themselves to make the plug. So use pretty much anything that's available, readily available to you in order to help you with your mold making and casting process. The same thing goes for those, uh, uh, the gator board that I use quite a bit. So this is very readily available, inexpensive, and uh, I use it quite a bit for mold making in the studio. So now with uh, all that being presented, as said, I do want to thank you guys for channeling in today and uh, do encourage you guys to leave any kind of comments and questions you might have down below in the description. Um, you're always welcome to submit us a tech ticket if you have questions or give us a call that we can answer directly. And uh, keep in mind to uh, uh, check out our next presentation that are going to be coming up or check out the older presentations that we have on our YouTube channel. And with that, I want to say goodbye and uh, thanks again for channeling in.